What's up? What's up, everybody? Uh, I told you last time I was on that I was going to improve the branding of the stream. And here I am back. Shout out to my man, Mr. Roscoe's. He really hooked me up. I mean, as you can see, I've got the entire setup. I've got the intro. I've got the um, uh, on screen branding, you know, with the overlays and everything. So I'm coming back with with a little bit more firepower. Here I am. Um, really excited to be on. I wanted to talk about the Niners defense. It's been a little bit of a while since I last streamed. Just kidding. I last streamed yesterday. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be on here and talk about the Niners defense. I did have an opportunity to go back and watch the game uh, a little bit later today or earlier today. And so I was able to see some things. And so I want to start here with the Niners defense. I think it's the best defense in the NFL. And I'm going to tell you why it's the best defense in the NFL. Um, I, I'm totally blown away by the Niners defense, to be honest with you. It's better than what I expected it to be this year, especially with Jimmy Ward out. And I think that it's the best defense in the NFL. I think it's going to get better with Jimmy Ward. I mean, we know the statistics, right? They're first in DVOA right now. They're giving up a very, very small 3.89, I think, yards per play, which is ridiculous, right? David Lombardi had the stat this morning, which we'll get to, which he compared this defense with the 2000 Ravens and the 02 Bucks. And I remember after my stream yesterday, I also brought up the 02 Bucks, and I'll bring them up again today. Um, with the Warren Sapp America's game quote. So um, I, I think that it's really interesting, right? It's the best defense in the NFL right now, statistically. We know that they've only given up a touchdown in two games. We saw what they did on the road against Russell Wilson. It, it's an unbelievable defense. But what makes it the best defense in the NFL, right? I think you have to start off. The defensive line is phenomenal. Nick Bosa is taking his game to a step Above, I think that, you know, a lot of people haven't, you know, talked about it with Nick Bosa because Bosa has been very good since he's come to the NFL. He looks even the best I've ever seen Nick Bosa. He looks a little bit, dare I say, I don't want to say slimmer, but his body looks a little bit more toned. He looks every bit as explosive. He's added a spin move to his game right before the Bosa brothers used to be masters of the two-handed scissor swipe. And they used to employ that move to win inside, win outside, and then they would vary it with their speed to power and their bull rush. Now you see Nick Bosa has a spin move to go with it. The other th small improvement in Nick Bosa's game as well is he's way more aware of chippers these days. I mean, how many times early in Nick Bosa's career would we see somebody get a real free kind of cheap shot at him where they would blindside chip him? You know, the same shot Leonard Fournette delivered to Micah Parsons. Um that really doesn't happen to Nick Bosa anymore. So the best defense in the NFL, you need a star player that this defense is built around. And it starts with Nick Bosa. He makes everybody on this defense better. The defensive line has incredible depth and is phenomenal. We know how good Armstead is. He's not played that much this year due to the plantar fascia. Um, Kinlaw has been very good, actually, this year, in my opinion. I know Kinlaw is a little bit of a controversial subject on how good he is, all of this. I mentioned last or not last week a few days ago when I went live about how I thought Javon Kinlaw some of the things he's done really well that's gone under the radar particularly his awareness in terms of when screens are coming his ability to find the running back peel off his rush and stuff screens he had a couple plays against Denver where he did that that was phenomenal and then he has a great awareness of getting his hands up in the pass game and disrupting the timing of the pass game and all of that when he doesn't win with the rush and then he has had a couple good he's had a couple good rushes as well. So I think Kinlaw is quite good from that standpoint. And I, so you talk about the entire defensive line, right? Givens has been terrific. Ebukam has been kicking butt. I, I would say Ebukam is somebody I was wrong on. I felt like early last season, Ebukam wasn't a fit in this defense. He then found his footing later within the season and I had some questions because they did scheme up a few pass rushes for him. Well, I was wrong. Ebukam is a star. I, I After they drafted Drake Jackson, in fact, I floated the idea on Twitter 
because he had $6.5 million of dead money that wasn't fully guaranteed, that possibly the Niners could cut Samson Mebukam and go forward with Kamiko Ture and Drake Jackson and Kerry Hyder at the time. I, I was 100% wrong on all those fronts. Samson Mebukam has been awesome so far this year. Samson Mebukam is going to make a lot of money next year as a pass rusher because, one, he's a th- every-down player. He's awesome against the run as well. Charles Umenehu has been terrific as well. So you go down the list and, right, the defensive line, even with injuries to a key player like Eric Armstead, who is so disruptive and is so good, and a key player like Javon Kinlaw, the Niners have no issues. The defensive line is awesome. It's maybe the deepest in the NFL. I don't know if it's the best. It's up there, though. It's one, two, three. It's the deepest for sure. And Nick Bosa has been a superstar to start this year. So they have an awesome defensive line. But it goes a step further, right? You have an offensive defensive line. Now you have elite linebackers too. Fred Warner is playing like Fred Warner. He's the best linebacker in the NFL. Every week when I watch other teams play, I get a greater appreciation for the Niners having Fred Warner. The things he's able to do in coverage, a lot of the zone hole matching that he does when they play coverages like Tampa 2 and the amount that he's able to carry receivers. I mean, there's a really, really good play. I, I don't post as much of these type of clips on Twitter, uh, mostly because I'm scared about the copyright. And also because by the time I get to a lot of these plays, people have already posted it and I don't want to add to the recycling of tips. But there was a really, really good play from two weeks ago of Fred Warner carrying Jerry Judy 20 yards down the field. And it, it, it's a small example of something he does week in and week out that makes the Niners coverage so good because his ability to match and carry routes through his zone, his ability to recognize what the offense is doing. And then, of course, how fast he diagnoses run versus pass, how well he tackles all of those things. He does it at such a high level. It makes this defense really go. Then Dre Greenlaw had a really, really good game yesterday as well. He's so fast. And he hits hard. Aziz Al-Shair is similarly a very good player who will come back from injury. So the linebackers are excellent. And then I think the one weakness with the Niners defense, if there's ever been a weakness over the last three years, is maybe the secondary play in the corners, according to some. Is this not the most underrated cornerback duo in the NFL? I mean, Charvarius Mooney Ward is terrific. He's been worth every penny the Niners have paid him. Uh, I, I feel like through the early part of this season, he's been a free agent signing. That's I didn't. I don't think that you know people really in the national uh, spectrum really had a idea of how good Mooney Charvarius Mooney Ward is and how much he can you know impact the 49ers defense. And we're seeing that Emmanuel Mosley has taken his game to another step. Um, I think he's going to make a lot of money. I've said this uh, every time I've streamed now. I think Manuel Mosley is going to make a lot of money this offseason. And so the secondary is terrific. The safeties are very, very good. I I have talked about them a lot when I've been doing streams recently. Um, Talanoa Hufanga is in the defensive player of the year conversation. Deshaun Gibson has played really, really well. He's kind of replaced Jaquaski Tart as a very steady post player for them as a safety and then just a guy whose assignment sound keeps the ball in front of him but he also has 29 career interceptions he dropped an interception in the red zone that was key on Monday he also had a very very good interception I think off of a terrific deflection from Hufanga week two um so I, I I do think he'll stay in this lineup when Jimmy Ward comes back I think the Niners played a lot of three safety looks um last year And we're going to see them play more and more three safety looks this year. It'll be interesting to see how they manage the roster. Um, Underrated thing about that is that they never have kept five safeties. Whether Gibson goes to the practice squad and gets elevated on game days to play because Odom and Moore are arguably the Niners' two best special teams players will be interesting how they handle the logistics of that move. But I think the most interesting thing is that Gibson is playing very, very well and Uh, Because of that, I I do expect the Niners to um, keep him on the field even when Jimmy Ward comes back, especially because they're able to move Ufanga around. Ufanga is shown to be very good in coverage. He's shown elite awareness. He's shown elite recognition and diagnosis of concepts that are commonly run by teams. It's everywhere. 
Um, he also has unbelievable ability against the run, and he's an amazing blitzer. So because of all those things and because of how good Jimmy Ward is in man coverage and how you're able to disguise man versus zone by putting Jimmy Ward over a tight end because or a slot receiver because he's capable of guarding either in man, but then you can also play zone off of it because he's a safety. Being able to make quarterbacks hesitate with tells like that I think is important. And so I do think Gibson would retain his spot and be kind of the steady post player that Chikwaski Tart was last year in those three safety defenses. They ran him, ran him a lot on third downs last year. I think this is the best team defense in the NFL. It's going to get better when Eric Armstead gets healthy, when Kinlaw gets healthy, when Ward gets healthy. But the Niners defense is the best in the NFL. So I see the chat is going off. I'll definitely get to some questions. I'm not going to stream for too long, but I did want to get to this, right? So if you have the best defense in the NFL, the automatic question is, can the 49ers defense carry them to a Super Bowl? Then you take it a step further and you say, in the modern NFL, is it possible for a defense to carry a team to a Super Bowl, right? The last defensive-driven Super Bowl team we saw was the no-fly zone defense with the 2015 Broncos featuring Von Miller and DeMarcus Ware and Aqib Tlaib and Chris Harris Jr., TJ Ward, uh, Darian Stewart. You can go down the list. They had a lot of really, really good players. Malik Jackson, Derek Wolf, And then before that, the 2012 Seahawks with, of course, the Legion of Boom, Michael Bennett, Cliff Averill, um, Bruce Irvin, Bobby Wagner, of course. And then before that, you have to go back to maybe the Patriots, but they had Tom Brady, so I think even though a lot of those early Super Bowls were driven by the defense with like Rodney Harrison, Seymour, Will Fork, Ty Law, those type of guys, a lot of people look at it and say Brady still kind of won those games late, so maybe not. The 2 Bucks for sure, the 2000 Ravens. But the point is, you have to be one of the greatest defenses we've ever seen for you to be a team that wins the Super Bowl because of your defense, right? And right now, the Niners offense hasn't played really well. So a lot of people are asking this question. I actually think this question is premature right now. I think the Niners offense is going to find a rhythm, and I think it's going to end up way more respectable amongst league rankings than people think. This game against Carolina, I think, is a great opportunity for the offense to put up numbers. The next game against Atlanta, Dean Pease is a really creative coach, but Atlanta still has a little bit of a talent discrepancy on their defense. So I think there's opportunities here for the Niners offense to get going. Um, I don't think this they're going to have an offense that's like the Trent Dill for 2000 Ravens or even like the Brad Johnson 2002 Bucks. I think it's going to be a little bit better than that, especially because of how good Debo is, how good Ayuk is. I think Kittle is going to get more involved into this offense. I don't think he's just automatically shunned. I think it just takes time for this offense to find rhythm. They didn't practice any of this with Garoppolo as much as that's not an excuse for how poor his play was against Denver. It is a reason for why, you know, this Niners offense isn't looking fully in sync. If you look around the NFL, offenses in general are not playing with great sync. A lot of people aren't playing in preseason. Practice rules are giving less reps and offense requires more reps than defense because so much of offense is based on timing and knowing where someone's going to be at the exact right time. And that takes time and reps as well. So I do think the Niners offense is going to be better. But is the Niners defense that level of iconic defense? Statistically, they're showing they are right now, right? The 3.8 yards per play is an insane stat. That's the stat that reflects that, you know, it's amongst the Niners, the 2000 Ravens, the 2002 Bucks. When this, when I was originally thinking about this topic, the first thing I thought was, well, you know, the Niners defense has to take this team to win a Super Bowl to be looked at that way, right? That was the first reaction. If they don't do that, you can't be looked at that way. Then my reaction was, well, when you want to talk about the 2000 Ravens, you're talking about Ray Lewis, and you're talking about, you know, some of the greatest defensive players in NFL history. When you're talking about the 02 Bucks, you're talking about five Hall of Famers. It, like, you know, you're talking about Simeon Rice, Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks, um, Rondé Barber, John Lynch. When you're talking about the 13 Seahawks, Legion of Boom, Richard Sherman's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Earl Thomas will be in the Hall of Fame. Wagner is going to be in the Hall of Fame. Michael Bennett was fantastic for an extended period of time. K.J. Wright was really good for a long time. Um, Cam Chancellor was 
terrific for the time that he played. So because of all of that, I, I asked my question, I looked at it and I was like, do the Niners really have those kinds of players? And they actually do. Nick Bosa is, you know, right now he's got a Hall of Fame start to his career. So does Fred Warner. Eric Armstead is a really good player. He's a Pro Bowl level player. Then you go down the defensive line. The Niners have a lot of guys that would start on other teams like Charles Omenehu, but they don't Kevin Gibbons. They don't start because they're part of the deepest defensive line in the NFL. You look at the line, you look at the safeties, right? Jimmy Ward's a terrific player when he's back. Talano Ufunga right now, he should be in the defensive player of the year conversation. He's everywhere. He's got a lot of tackles for a loss. He's got a couple of interceptions. He's got a couple pass deflections. He is making plays everywhere. He's in the defensive player of the year conversation. It's too young in his career to project where it could end up. But right now, a fifth round rookie who threw four games is playing amongst the best at his position in football. The sky is really the limit for how good he's going to be. So when you're talking about all of those things, and then, of course, Mooney Ward's a Pro Bowl level corner. So is Emmanuel Mosley. The Niners' names on their defense might not have the same cachet as some of these other defenses we're talking about. And part of that is their brand going, right? That cachet will be there for these guys if they have an iconic playoffs and the Niners make it to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl behind those behind the defense. So I'm fully aware of that. And it's, it's kind of a push and pull and a give and take with that. But at the same time, I actually have changed my mind a little bit on this. Do I think the Niners defense should be in the conversation with those all-time great defenses right now? No, because they have to have a resume, a bit of evidence in win, in the playoffs, winning the Super Bowl, to prove that they are in the same level of those defense in terms of legacy, talent, all of it. But do I think this Niners defense is capable of carrying, winning, taking them to the Super Bowl? I do. I think that's where I've changed my outlook on this conversation, right? I think a lot of people here know that I, I'm a guy that doesn't believe the Niners can win a Super Bowl with Garoppolo. I think that the level of quarterback that he is, I think it's really hard to win the Super Bowl. With this defense, I think they are capable of winning the Super Bowl. with. And I think the big difference com with this defense compared to even 2019 where they did take the ball away is they take the ball away and they're finding ways to score on defensive and defense and special teams. They now have two defense and special teams uh, no, excuse me. They only have the one defense touchdown, but they're still finding a way to score on defense. So that kind of ruins my point, excuse me. But still, I, I think it's the fact that they're continuing to find the take, take the ball away. I think this is the most multiple the Niners defense has been. It was exceptionally creative last year, but it's even more creative. I mean, they blitzed the most I've ever seen them really blitz under D'Amico Ryan's yesterday. And the pressures are really, really creative. D'Amico Ryans does an incredible job on third downs, especially because now you you don't know if the Niners are going to just play zone because they're capable of just lining up and playing man coverage with Ward and Mosley. And Lenore had a really good rep in man against Cooper Cup yesterday. And then when Jimmy Ward comes back. So because they're capable of that, the Niners have so much diversity in their defense. D'Amico Ryans is the sim pressure master. He'll put seven guys on the line of scrimmage and two will come from the right and he'll drop two from the left. It's really a four-man pressure, but the quarterback's rhythm and the entire protection plan is messed up. And then he'll do some insane things with how they play coverage, how late their rotations are, how they rotate, the way they make their pre-snap looks look the same. It's unbelievable how well they're playing, how organized they're playing. I do think it's a defense capable of carrying them to the Super Bowl. I think that... It matches up well with offenses like the Bills. Like, yeah, Josh Allen is Superman, but right now the Bills offense is very one-dimensional to me. I have questions about whether they can run the ball in close games and win close games. If you're one-dimensional against the Niners defense with that pass rush, with that coverage unit, it's a tough place to be, even if you have Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs. If I look at the Chiefs with Tyreek Hill, I think it would scare me, and I would say, no, Niners defense could not – you know, win a Super Bowl because Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey, they're just too special to go with Mahomes. But now without Tyree Kill, I think the Chiefs are still the best team in the NFL. I think Mahomes is still the best quarterback in the NFL. But I don't think there's anything that should really make the Niners defense be so scared that they can't cover, even if they do everything right, Tyree Kill can screw things up. I don't think that's the case. There's anybody like that on the Chiefs offense. So I look at the outlook of the NFL where I look at the two best offenses and I feel like that. 
And then I look at the talent on this defense. I look at how good the scheme is um, with D'Amico Ryans and how creative they are and multiple they are. I do think this is a defense capable of carrying them to a Super Bowl. Um, I, it's going to be definitely something that's fluid in terms of how you look at it, depending on who's healthy, depending on how well they're playing at the time. Right now, given how they're playing, right now, given how Ryan's is coaching, and right now, given who we think is going to be healthy and who is already healthy and playing really well, I do think that this is a defense carry, capable of carrying them to the Super Bowl. And that's actually a different outlook I've had compared to years past, especially with the Jimmy Garoppolo-led Niners. So I'm way more excited to see how this season ends up because this defense, to me, is the best defense that we've seen under Kyle Shanahan. So before I get to my final topic, I wanted to get a couple of questions. Brian, thank you for the donation. Really appreciate it. Do you think Jimmy makes his first Pro Bowl this year? He showed flashes. Honestly, I think it's a possibility. Jalen Hurts, I think, is going to make the Pro Bowl for sure from the NFC. Aaron Rodgers will probably make the Pro Bowl. And then who's the next Pro Bowl quarterback, right? Dak's been hurt. Kyler Murray's had a mess of a season in Arizona. It's not too bad in terms of how he's played, but Arizona's a complete mess. Stafford has not had a very good season. Um, maybe Jared Goff, Kirk Cousins, these type of guys. But if the Niners are, you know, 13 and four at the end of the season and they're the two seed, there's a really good chance actually that Garoppolo could be in the Pro Bowl. I, I, I think that that's something that a lot of Niners fans would be like, really? You're going to put him in the Pro Bowl? All of that. But you think about where his stats could end up at the end of the season, the kind of games he could have, the way Debo has looked. Uh, it's possible Garoppolo could have, you know, very top five of the league type efficiency numbers when we're talking about EPA per play, completion percentage, yards per attempt, these type of numbers that are commonly used for fans to and fans, whoever votes for the Pro Bowl to be able to decipher who the Pro Bowl quarterbacks are. I do think there's a big opportunity actually for him to make the Pro Bowl this year, as shocked as I am to say that. Yeah. I don't think he's a Pro Bowl level quarterback. I think that's a different conversation, but I think he can make the Pro Bowl this year, especially given how the other prominent quarterbacks in the NFC have started. Maybe Brady makes it too, but even Brady outside of um, la uh, last game hasn't had a huge season statistically. I think probably Brady, Rodgers, Jalen Hurts end up being the quarterbacks, but then, you know, a lot of people pull out. Hopefully Garoppolo doesn't even have to play in the Pro Bowl because the Niners are busy preparing for the Super Bowl. That's what I would say is probably the best answer to that question. Uh, so appreciate the donation, Brian. Really appreciate the donation, Paulo Chuman. Keep crushing it, Vish. Your content's awesome. I, I appreciate that. Any feedback is welcome. Obviously, this is the first time I'm doing content by myself. I don't know how well this is working, but... If you are enjoying it, I really appreciate it. Uh, please make sure to like and like, subscribe, all of those type of things. And I really appreciate all of your support. I did want to get to one more question uh, that I saw in the comments. There have been a lot of good questions. I appreciate all of your supports. Please do add them in. I will go in and answer a few questions after I finish the topics that I have planned. I, I missed that last question. So my final topic is pretty straightforward and simple. I think that it's something that I shouldn't really have to talk about, but I guess we have to talk about it today. Nick Bosa is not getting enough love for the defensive player of the year conversation. I'm talking about a guy that's leading the league in quarterback hits, quarterback pressures, and sacks. And I I, I look at the defensive player of the converse, year conversation, excuse me, nationally, and it feels like it's Micah Parsons, just Micah Parsons. And Micah Parsons, to me, is maybe the best defensive player in the NFL. It's maybe him. I think that he's closest. The only player I've ever felt in Donald's prime that like, ooh, that might, Donald might not be the best defensive player in the NFL. I mean, Micah Parsons is a top five off the ball linebacker in the NFL. And then he's maybe the best pass rusher in the NFL. The guy basically gets pressure every play he pass rushes. He's a phenomenal football player. But right now, I feel like Nick Bosa is having a better season than him. Uh, Nick Bosa could have very easily had five sacks yesterday. Matthew Stafford avoided a couple of very, very close calls with a little bit of clumsy athleticism, but athleticism nonetheless. He was able to avoid pressure. I mean, Bosa had, what, 10 pressures yesterday, which is unheard of. 
um, three quarterback hits, two sacks. That could have easily been five. I, I really thought watching that game, that was an iconic 49ers pass rush performance at a prime time in my life. As you know, and might remember 10 years ago, Alden Smith used to be delivering those. Uh, the first of which was the game against Pittsburgh on Monday night or on Sunday night. Yeah, it was on Monday night, actually, when Ben Roethlisberger came to San Francisco with the bum ankle and Alden Smith abused Max Starks and John Gruden and Ron Jaworski were saying after the game that Alden Smith should be in the Hall of Fame. And then Alden Smith also had that insane Monday night performance in Colin Kaepernick's first start where he had five and a half sacks against the Bears. To me, this Nick Alden Smith, every primetime game just dominated and was the best player on the field and just showed out. That was the kind of performance I thought Nick Bosa put on on Sunday night against Denver. And then I thought he played even better uh, this week against the Rams. I mean, of course, it helps when, you know, the Rams are starting Joe Noteboom and David Edwards, who have no chance at blocking Nick Bosa. But, you know, Bosa's got to do what Bosa's got to do. I, I do think that we're a little premature here. I think we're ahead of the curb and getting ahead of this because I think Nick Bosa is going to have another great game the way he did against the Panthers, you know, three years ago in 2019. That was the best game of Nick Bosa's career till now. The interception, the three sacks in the first half, he was kicking butt in that game. I think we're going to see a similar statement game from Bosa this week. I think this week the Niners are going to blow out the Panthers. Panthers, I'm going to, you know, preview that game a little bit more later in the week, probably stream on Friday or Saturday to talk about that, but the Panthers really have no shot against this 49ers defense. That's what I believe. If I'm wrong, I will eat a lot of crow about it, but unfortunately from I, from a schematic talent standpoint, I do not see how this Panthers offense is going to move the ball against the Niners defense. And so, um, yeah, I do. I do think that next week we might be sitting here and, Nick Bosa will be firmly entrenched in the middle of that defensive player of the year conversation coming off a three sack game against Carolina. But I think he should be there today. He's been the Niners best player so far this season. He's been their MVP as he is just about every single season. And um, I think that it's really, really fun to watch his career play out because we are seeing a hall of fame career and we're watching it unfold in front of us. He's been unreal in every single game uh he's played just about in his career so i'm excited to see what happens with the rest of this season and hopefully nick bosa does get that first all pro team appearance and the defensive player of the year award but that's all i had planned for today i did not expect 180 people to be in here so i really appreciate all of you for supporting me i do want to answer a few questions uh, I know a lot of people are still, you know, surprised that I'm back on YouTube and stuff like that. So I, I'm willing to answer questions really about anything for maybe another 10, 10, 15 more minutes. So if you have any questions, throw them in the chat, please like subscribe. I appreciate all of your support. Um, and I'm definitely exciting, excited interacting with all of you on YouTube again, definitely loving the back and forth, the, the, the being able to talk about football in this medium again. I missed it, and I'm excited to be back and give you more content. My buddy Jamal says, go to bed. Uh, you got work in the morning. I do got work in the morning, but it's not too late. It's about 10.15 right now. I'm thinking we end the stream around 10.30. Central gives me about 30 minutes to get situated and get to bed around 11 o'clock. Um, John has a great question. Does Deshaun Gibson's rise mean we won't re-sign Jimmy Ward? I do think that Jimmy Ward doesn't um, get re-signed. I think that he's 32 years old. Um, I think that the Niners are going to have to pay other players, you know, like Emmanuel Mosley. Uh, they're going to have to pay, make a decision on Yabukam. And Ward is kind of the elder statement. I would hate to see him go. I've been one of Jimmy Ward's biggest fans for a while now. There was a time it's nice to see everybody appreciates him. Now, I do remember when I first started doing this on YouTube and stuff, it was always funny to hear the conversation because a lot of people were upset that I would be so high on Jimmy Ward. It's nice that he's gotten a real appreciation for his play. 
but I do think that he's a player that ultimately the Niners might have to part ways with this offseason just due to you have to make the best decisions for your organization and you might value a corner in Emmanuel Mosley more than you value a great safety in Jimmy Ward, who's 32 years old. And so um, I think because of that, it's definitely possible they don't bring him back. Now, there's a lot that goes into that because I do think Ward's capable of getting another big payday. And I think there's a lot of teams in the NFL that would pay him. He's a true free safety with center field range. He has the ability to drop down into the slot. Um he has an incredible ability to cover in man coverage. He's terrific in zone. He's a terrific tackler. All of those things are really true, and I, I don't want to sound like someone who's negative on Jimmy Ward at all. I'm very positive on him. But the reality of the business of the NFL is if you look at what business decisions the Niners have to make, he might be a guy that might not be re-signed because of that. Now, he hasn't played this year yet, and – He's probably going to have another terrific season. Now, where we look at Ward after the season is going to be very, very interesting because I think it will also change, right? This conversation is fluid right now. The Niners defense goes and lays an egg and Ward doesn't play next week. Then we'll all be clamoring for Ward to be back. So I do want to mention that. But today, the way I look at it, the way Hufunga has play, been playing – the way they've been able to use Hufunga. I, I think there's another veteran safety that could be signed similar to Tashawn Gibson that, you know, plays in the post, plays very steady. Adrian Amos, a guy who's not played very well in Green Bay so far um, this year. Green Bay has a year-to-year -year type catch situation. What if Amos gets released by Green Bay? Ward would definitely command more money than Adrian Amos in the open market. He's a better player than Amos. But Amos has played on a team that plays a lot of quarters. He can play as a half field safety. He can drop down and play as a robber. He's very good in the run game. He's a great tackler. All of those things are true. And he might be a guy that just makes more sense from a value standpoint next to Funga. So I, I, I don't mean to have this conversation to say that Ward is gone, definitely. Gibson has played well, so Ward is gone because Gibson and Ward don't play same roles on this defense. Gibson is doing a lot of the things Tart used to do, and he's doing a really, really good job as their post safety. He plays very, very steady. He's very clean. He's assigned and sound. He's had an awesome year so far, especially for a guy that they signed uh, so late in the offseason and started week one, kind of from a desperate standpoint. Um, but Ward's value still exists. And I, I think it'll be really interesting to see um, if what they ultimately end up choosing to do with Jimmy Ward, because at 32, given everybody who they need to pay, given how good Hufunga is, this is a guy that maybe they don't resign, to be honest. And that would hurt a lot. Longest tenured player, big fan of Jimmy Ward. But the reality of the situation is, as much as we don't want to have these conversations and we want to just enjoy the Niners playing right now, this is definitely a possibility in the offseason. MRCTG, the GOAT, says, Hey, Vish, are you from Chirac or Chicago? I'm actually from the suburbs, so I'm not really from either. I live like 40 minutes from the city, so I'm from the suburbs just outside of the city. So I guess I don't really count to be from Chirac or Chicago, but most people don't know like what suburb I'm from. So of course I just mentioned I'm from the city of Chicago. So um, I actually haven't watched that game yet. I am going to watch it this week, um, but I will definitely talk about this, what I think Carolina does well. I've not watched a lot of Panthers at all this year. I mean, why would I have? They're not very interesting, and I wasn't that interested to see how Baker Mayfield played in a really crappy offense. So um, I'll, I'm going to watch them this week, probably tomorrow and Thursday. It's on my to-do list, but once I get to that, I'll do a preview for the game probably later in the week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, sometime around then. Most likely Friday or more likely Thursday, one of those two days, depending on I'll post on the community and see what people would prefer. But 
Um, I will definitely go over that. What I think Carolina does well, how I think they'll match up for the with the 49ers. My maybe my big question, just looking at the two rosters, would be how are the Niners gonna maybe block them? You know, Brian Burns, Derek Brown, it's the Panthers have a good front, but I'm not that nervous about them blocking them, to be honest. The Niners offensive line has actually played decently well. It's tough that Trent Williams is out. Jalen Moore struggled versus Denver, played okay when he came in yesterday. We'll see how he does. But I think that when Shanahan is able to get again ahead of the sticks and when he's really in a rhythm as a play call, and I think he found one versus the Rams, the Niners are able to mitigate protection issues and are able to have really good plans on how they're able to set up great angles and leverage for blocks. And so because of all of that, I do think that um, – the Niners should be fine being able to protect against what is considered to be a very good front led by a very good player in Brian Burns. Brandon Vincent has a really nice question. Do I think Kittle will be relegated to run blocking and pass protection the whole season? What do I see his role being in the pass game? I think it depends really game to game. Right now, I think Kittle is essential for them in the run game. And they need him in the pass game just because of where their offensive line is. He's just one of their best pass protectors. Um, I, I, I just think that so much of George Kittle's production has been hot and cold and streaky the last two years, right? He had that stretch of games where he was amazing last year versus Cincinnati, versus Seattle, um, versus Atlanta. I think he played well, too. Uh, I, I don't want to um give you the wrong numbers here but I thought he played well last year was a big step forward for George Kittle in terms of scoring touchdowns right he scored six touchdowns that was huge um so he's been a little bit streaky in general like yeah for example George Kittle Last year, he started off Detroit, five catches, 78 yards. Great game. Then at Philadelphia, four catches, 17 yards. There we see the streakiness, right? Um, and then he went back to seven catches, 92 yards versus Green Bay. Then four catches, 40 yards. Then six catches, 100 yards. Then five catches, 50 yards. Four catches, 34 yards. One catch, 13 yards. And then he exploded against Seattle for nine catches, 181 yards, two touchdowns. Exploded against Cincinnati, like I mentioned, exploded against Seattle again, and then once again fell off at the end of the season. So I think his production is going to remain similarly where it goes through a little bit of that up and down. It's going to be a little bit of a wave. I mentioned this in the post game, and I, I'm sticking to it. The Niners offense revolves around Debo Samuel. Um, it, it is about Debo Samuel now, and George Kittle has become a secondary option in the pass and run game. It's become more about Debo Samuel the last couple of years, which is fine. I still think George Kittle is one of the better players in the NFL. I think he's still one of the best tight ends in the NFL. He still blocks his ass off, and I expect him to be a big part of the pass game. I mean, Garoppolo's two best throws yesterday were, in fact, to Kittle. I, the throw that Kittle didn't get both feet in bounds, one of the best throws I've ever seen Garoppolo make to lay that ball across the back pylon. And then, of course, the strike – when they were running four verticals versus quarters through it just past the linebacker, really, really good throw. So uh, I do expect Kittle's role to be a lot bigger over the subsequent weeks for sure. So this comment section has been a little bit wild for sure. Um, but I guess I could answer this question and I think I'll take one more question. So, if you got a question that you think I should answer, throw it in there right now. Um, but Josh Cheney asked a great question. Why do I think they're not using Mason? I, I don't think it's a concerted effort not to use Mason. I think it's clear that right now in the running back hierarchy, Jeff Wilson is the running back one. It's similar to how it was in week one when, he met, when Elijah Mitchell was seemingly the um, running back one, but I, I've talked about it with Mason. I think Shanahan has mentioned it in regards to Mason. I don't think he's, they trust him at this point. Um, I don't know if it's just not carrying the ball, but clearly they don't trust him in terms of being able to execute all his assignments correctly, whether it's pass block, whether it's be viable in the past game, whether it's to do all those kinds of things. I, I don't think that the Niners, he's in their trust tree, trust, whatever, trust circle, Whatever it is for Kyle Shanahan, I don't think Jeff Wilson is there yet. 
I don't think this is alarming either by any means. I know he's a fan favorite player, but they kept him over a third round pick in Trey Sermon. So they clearly like him. There's a level of investment in towards him. He's just not that guy for them at this point. Jeff Wilson has played well. He had an okay game versus Denver. I thought he played very well against um, the Rams yesterday. He looked as explosive as I've ever seen Jeff Wilson look on that touchdown run, which was pretty exciting to see. So because of all of that, I think that's how Jordan Mason falls into this right now. Um, We'll see how it goes. Things change during the season. I mean, Ambry Thomas was a great example of this last year. D'Amador Lenore was the example of the opposite. Ambry Thomas came into the trust circle. They were able to see um, and get excited, and he was able to start the remaining remainder of the season after he was a guy they clearly weren't high on early into his rookie season. Lenore was the opposite. They were high on Lenore after the offseason. They were very happy with him early in the season, and then he kind of fell out of the Niners' trust circle. And ultimately, he was the one defensive back that really didn't get an opportunity to play at the end of last season. So um, I, I think that a lot of this is fluid. We react to a lot of it as it happens. But really, so much changes week to week in an NFL season because the duration is over such a long period of time. I do think Jordan Mason might eventually have a role in this offense. It's possible. But today, I would my, I would venture to guess that he is a guy the 49ers offense doesn't currently trust to be able to be fully assignment sound. They Jeff Wilson's clearly the guy they really trust. And so, yeah, it's been 40 minutes. I appreciate all of you tuning in. I, again, I did not expect 230 people to be in here. That's awesome. I appreciate all of you tuning in, and I appreciate all of your support. I do want to take one last question. So um, I, I want to make sure I find a really, really good question here. So if you guys see one, please direct me towards it. Otherwise, I'm going to be scrolling in this chat for one. It's been a lot of reckless things said in this chat. It's pretty funny, though. I'm glad you guys are enjoying the stream, having a good time interacting with each other as long as you keep it respectful. Um, but if you could direct me to any question that you would like me to answer, uh, or I will just keep searching in this chat for a question. Seems like there's new comments. Yes, sir. I just saw this. My man, Jesse Naylor is in here. He is the man. Um, he actually had our original overlays made for Blake and Rich Sports. I don't know if he still does them, but if he does, his overlays are also awesome. So make sure you reach out to him. He's also Last Second Sports on YouTube. I'm sure all of you are already subscribed. He's awesome. But yeah, Chris, Mr. Roscoe is on Twitter. He really did me right. I'm loving the new setup. Uh, I hope you guys are liking it too, but it's it's pretty cool. Um, Doctor Doom MD asks. Ooh, there's a couple of really good questions, Doctor Doom MD. I don't know if this is the question that's going to make it. I might have to put you on the back burner. Because um, Kareem Hunt, that might be a greater topic closer to the trade deadline. I think the question might be, um, somebody asked about, I just saw the question. Somebody's asked about uh, Verrett and Jim. Oh, there it is. Steve, there's the question. And somebody else asked about Verrett as well. What's your take on the secondary depth? Depth, excuse me. Can't talk right now with Verrett and Ward back. So my take on the secondary depth is pretty much this. I think the depth in general right now is very good. Um, Ambry Thomas had a very rough off season by all accounts. He had a rough preseason, but he also had a rough off season. He had a rough preseason last year and he ended up doing very well during the season. So I'm not writing him off at this point. I don't know, but 
Lenore currently is playing very well. Womack has shown a lot of flashes that make you excited. And then Mosley and Mooney Ward are playing like Pro Bowl caliber quarters. Now, when Verrett comes back, I, I don't th- I think Verrett at this point is a little bit of a safety net for this season. I don't really know where he fits in. Mosley and Ward aren't not going to start. They're playing awfully too well. Maybe you move him to nickel. Verrett is capable of playing nickel, but he's not really played nickel. He is cap- he is an outside corner. Um, and Lenore is playing really, really well at the moment. He's playing great versus the run. He's playing great versus the pass. So he's doing both of those things at, an, at a high enough level where it's tough to envision me seeing Lenore getting replaced. Verrett does have an extensive injury history that, you know, I, I don't want to rehash, but it's something that has to be discussed anytime you're talking about Jason Verrett. As good a player as he is, that's really the question mark behind him. He is coming off of an ACL. I wouldn't be shocked if he's a guy that practices, but the Niners just kind of keep him on the back burner if somebody gets hurt. It's it's more of a desperate situation for them. I don't think they need Jason Red at this point. I don't think Jason Red needs to risk his body at this point, given how injured he's been. This season might be a great opportunity for him to get healthy. Who knows? Emmanuel Wosley could walk next offseason. He could get a lot of money in free agency. They could re-sign Jason Verrett on another one-year deal. He has another one season to get healthy this year, and they bring him back, and he competes for the starting job opposite of Mooney Ward next year. That could be the possibility with Jason Verrett. But at this point, I don't see Jason Verrett entering the active 53 at this point. He doesn't play special teams, and I don't see him starting at corner as good as he is just because of his injury history and how well those other guys have been playing. And so... From that standpoint, I I I don't think Jason Ver I, I do think the Jason Verrett conversation becomes interesting. Now I, I think he's a great safety net to have because if somebody does get injured and Jason Verrett is healthy, that's a top ten corner, top fifteen corner in the NFL. But instead, if everyone's healthy, you could just allow Verrett to get healthy and still be okay. So that would be my outlook on Verrett. In regards to Jimmy Ward, I I touched on this earlier in the show, but I would like to continue elaborating on it, right? I I don't think they're going to bench to Sean Gibson. I think the way they handle these logistics of the 53 roster, whether he's on the practice squad with Sean Gibson, is going to be interesting. Um, They've never kept five safeties in their 53-man roster in the history of Kyle Shanahan, John Lynch. They're going to keep four safeties no matter what because their two special, best special teams players are their two backup safeties and George Odom and then Tarverius Moore, who's currently hurt. So once Jimmy Ward comes back, he's going to be starting next to Hufunga, we know. We saw the capability of a three-safety defense last year with Tart Hufunga and Ward. I do think we see that again with Tashawn Gibson, Ward, and Hufunga. I think they remove Dre Greenlaw and they go dime a little bit more like they did last year. And if that's the case, I do think Tashawn Gibson is going to see the field. Now, is he going to be a guy where they elevate him on game day and he's on the practice squad like a Malik Turner? I don't know. Somebody might poach him off the practice squad because he's played well, but then he's also a veteran safety. A lot of teams have veteran safeties. There's not a market for veteran safeties at this point, really, in the NFL. Once you hit 30, um, teams really just look to get younger at that position or they're signing you for the veteran minimum, which is kind of the position Deshaun Gibson's in. So maybe somebody else resigns him, though I don't know. I think the logistics of how they handle him on the 53-man roster is going to be interesting, but I think he's still going to play when Ward comes back. So that would be my outlook on the secondary depth. I think Verrett is total insurance policy. If he plays, it's because somebody gets hurt. Otherwise, I don't see how he fits in, given that making him an active 53 roster member when he doesn't play special teams and you still have long term concerns about his health because of the injuries he's all recovered from is a question mark. And then with Ward, he's obviously going to come back and start. He's going to resume his role that he's played in this defense the last three years. The question is, how is Tashawn Gibson going to fit in even with Ward? Because I don't think they're just going to completely remove him out of this defense. It's too it's too nice to have a guy that plays like a veteran who's so assignment sound, plays so steady in the post, just knows, understands past concepts, just understands how to play the safety position. 
it's too valuable to have that, I think, and not have him be on the field at some point. So I have gone a little bit longer than I expected, about 50 minutes. I appreciate all of you joining. I do want to answer this one last question from G Code Travels Vlog Point of View. Um, Ray Ray McLeod's fumbles could hurt us. Kyle Williams 2.0. Well, Kyle Williams didn't really have, from what I remember, a fumbling issue until that infamous championship game. I don't remember him necessarily having a fumbling issue before. Now, he didn't get that many return reps prior to that. I, If I remember correctly, he was a rookie, I think, in 2011. And uh, in 2011, they had obviously signed Teddy Ginn Jr., who was taking care of all the return duties. So uh, maybe I'm misremembering this. But that's how I remembered that. Um, Ray Ray McLeod does have a fumbling problem. It's been scary the last two weeks, right? He muffed the punt versus Denver before the last drive started, before the Jeff Wilson fumble. That was a mess of a possession because Garoppolo also took a sack on first down, which was disgusting. So you had so many issues across the board. That was bad. And then, of course, he had the fumble that Marlon Mack recovered off the kickoff return on Monday. I, I think that um, it's scary given his history, but at the same time, he's also producing as a returner in a way that we haven't seen a Niners returner produce in a long time, right? They're getting net positives on these returns in both the kickoff return game and the punt return game. In field position, especially when you have a defense as good as the 49ers defense is, is very, very important. And that's where I don't actually fault Shanahan as much for his lack of aggressiveness on these fourth down decisions, just because this team is capable of winning with their defense. And um, right now they are winning with their defense. And so you do want to dominate field position. Um, so because of all of this, um, I, I don't think Ray Ray McLeod's fumbling problem, as much as I've been someone who's harped on it, on Twitter and on YouTube through the off season when they signed him and all of that is really something that we have to look at as an issue right now. Maybe I'm just saying that because he's not lost a fumble and the Niners are coming off a huge win and I'm just being positive possible. But today I don't look at that issue because of how well he's returned in the punt game, how well he's returned in the kickoff game and say like, man, it's the worst thing in the world. Cause it was tough to watch Trent Taylor just bear catch every punt. It was tough to watch Bosun who returned punts for a while. So it's exciting to see somebody who's capable of doing something with the ball in their hands back there. But I do appreciate all of you joining. It's been very fun. Uh, I always love talking football with all of you. I will most likely be back sometime later in this week, Friday, probably not Saturday, but probably on Friday to preview the Panthers game. I do think it's a game the Niners are going to win big. Um, I, it's been really exciting for me the last few days to relaunch my YouTube channel. Um, really, I'm really honestly, uh, flattered and, um, tr truly humbled by the amount of support I've gotten from each and every one of you. It's really an honor. I, I really enjoy doing this and I enjoy interacting with each and every one of you. You guys make this fun for me. It's, I love talking about football and you guys, uh, lo seem to love talking about football as well. And it's fun to have that back and forth fourth interaction which is great um and i really appreciate all of your support um i i do plan to be back later in this week as i mentioned and i hope to see you guys there um definitely enjoy the support and uh i will be back soon have a great rest of your night and i will see you next time